All right, we are here again, and we are doing our preparation for the Agricultural Science CSEC exam. Um, if you enjoy our videos, we just want you to subscribe, share, like. You can even put your comments um, based on the questions, or if you have a particular question to ask, you can do so. So let's get right into it. So this is paper two um, of the year 2012. So it says, identify the agricultural career associated with each of the following. A person who advises farmers on crop and livestock management. So basically we're talking about that person who is the link between the farmer and the researcher, the extension officer. So they give the farmers the critical um, knowledge and the different methods of how to carry out the task after being informed by the researcher. A person who treats disease in livestock, the veterinarian. And so they will ensure that your animals are basically, you know, up to par without any form of infections or treat the diseases. No, it doesn't stop there. We just want to quickly run through some other careers in agriculture. We would have had the agronomist, who is the person who deals with the management of soil and the growing of crops. We have the plant pathologist, who deals with diseases. We have the food inspector, who goes around to newly built or um, um, built up organizations to ensure that food is done or prepared in a, you know, it can be consumed, it's free of any disease or pathogens. We also have the entomologist, the person who deals with the use and the control of insects. We have the apiculturist, the person who deals with the rearing of bees. You know, we get honey. And the list goes on, horticulturist, florist. They could have asked you any of those, a landscaper, all of those would be the careers and I just want to encourage young persons to be a part of agriculture. You can basically have any career path once you go down the route of agriculture. Part B says a biotechnologist predicts that in the near future, right, in the near future the Caribbean region will be faced with severe food shortages. Um, so just one way in which biotechnology can improve crop production. It is a major talk right now. We want to ensure that there is food security, availability of food by everyone, not just food, but nutritious food. And so as our mouth increase in terms of the population of a country worldwide, is just the same in the Caribbean. We want to ensure that we have the food we need and so we can do modification through technology technology which means that we're going to be using microorganisms or animals and plants to improve on agriculture and so in crop production one of the focus is to we are now experiencing drought we have climate change, so we can modify crops so that they can withstand or tolerate drought conditions. We can improve crop so that they can have better yield. We can improve crop so that they can be more um, resistant to pests and diseases. And that would have captured for crops. For livestock is the same concept. We want to improve them so that we can feed our nation. And we can do that through improve in growth rate, better FCR, um, more tolerant to drought, more tolerant to pest and disease. Um, basically, these are the modifications that biotechnology can do to increase our food. Moving right along. We're talking about supply and demand. We know demand is the quantity that would be required by the consumer at a given time at a particular price. We know supply deals with the 
quantity offered at a given time for a given price. In terms of agriculture, the farmer is usually considered the supplier. Law of demand states that once you have an increase in the demand, you're going to, it would be due to a, a decrease in price. So if the price decrease, then demand should increase. Likewise, if the price increase, the supply will increase. The farmer will want to try and maximize his profit. But they gave us this graph. My apologies. When, when I converted this to a Word document, we, we saw where you know, some of the information um, did not come over properly. But if you look closely, you are asked to identify, well, you haven't seen the question as yet, but you're, if we talk about it, we see two curves. How do we know which is which? We know the demand curve slopes from top left to bottom right. Top left, bottom right. For the supply curve, it is from top right to bottom left. And so X is the demand curve. Now, this is a, 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 a misconception of students when, when you look at a point, that point Y, we consider that to be the equilibrium point. Now, the equilibrium point is the point at which the same quantity is demanded, the same quantity is supplied at that particular price. So, in the questions, they could have asked you, what is the equilibrium um, quantity? They could have asked you the equilibrium point. So right there, that is what is happening. So if we go down to deal with the questions, and that's the information that was basically, you know, brought forward incorrectly. Figure one, the demand and the supply curve. Um, identify X and Y. We said X would have been the demand curve. Y would have been the equilibrium point. A farmer observed the um, over the years, that in January, there is an oversupply of sorrel on the market. So just two strategies that the farmer can use to make money from his surplus sorrel, of, um, sorrel crop. Now, we just spoke about the whole concept of demand. And if we know demand works, as we said, if we can lower the price. So what we can ask the farmer to do is to just lower the price. And what this will do is to attract the consumers. So persons will start to buy more and so we'll get money. It's better than to just have the soil on surplus and none of it is actually sold. It may be, become spoiled. The next thing, he can basically offer some of this soil for export. And he could actually get foreign exchange from that um, income. He could also convert the soil to drink. You know, in, in, in Jamaica, we just, we, we, we really want to just add a little ginger, right? For those who are, you know, knowing about our sorrel, we just add a little ginger, and yes, we have our sorrel drink. So we can convert that sorrel into a secondary product, and even by doing so, it may actually lengthen the shelf life. So we have different companies here, different um, organizations that may basically take the soil and he could have sold, sold it to them or do, do it himself, bottle it and basically earn an income from that. And from saying that you award your two marks. Moving right along. Farmers Ramesh and Leela have land in the same agricultural area. Soil tests were indicated that the soil from Ramesh plot has a pH of 4.5 and the soil from Leela's plot has a pH of 6.5. Now, it is very important that you know that the pH scale ranges from 0 to 14 and 7 is the midway and it's actually the neutral point. Anything below 7 is considered to be acidic and the more you move toward the 0 mark, the more acidic you get. As you go above 7, you're a base or alkaline, and as you go further to 14, you get more alkaline. 
Cool? So when we look at these two pH reading from both these persons farm, the 4.5 would have been the one that is more acidic. But it says, what is meant by the term pH? It is the percentage of hydrogen ions because the hydrogen ions are the ones that basically influence how acidic or how alkaline the soil would have been. Whose plot of land is more acidic? And we said farmer Ramesh, he would have won that contest, right? He has a pH of 4.5. So the lower the pH, the more acidic the soil would have been. It says, um, suggest one reason that may account for the difference in the soil pH between the two plots of land. No, it may be based on the activities. No, because they're growing, one farmer might, and we are just going to be um, assuming Farmer Ramesh could have been using fertilizers, artificial fertilizers, synthetic fertilizers, fertilizers that were created by man. And the disadvantage of using these fertilizers at time is that it increases soil acidity. And so he could have been doing that. And based on this application of fertilizer, it would have caused the soil to become more acidic. Now, another thing, the type of soil that is there. If you have a clay type soil, the, this type of soil is more capable of holding water. The thing about water logging is that it increases acidity again. So that could have been two reasons that would have led to Farmer Rami's plot to be more acidic than Leela's plot. So part D says, recommend one soil management practice. Right? And we would be there, and we're just bringing in a little talk. Yo, we want to deal with Mr. Ramish Platt. And, and this is how we speak in, in our Creole in Jamaica. We talk about management practice, right? That can be used to increase the productivity of acidic soil. We want something. When we add it to the soil, it's going to increase the pH or decrease acidity. And what is it that we use? We use calcium carbonate. And this will basically increase. Um, you talk about something like limestone. Um, it's the same thing that we use to make our cement. So this calcium carbonate is of a, a basically a, a, a base in, 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 its, in its makeup, it's a substance. So what it will do is to neutralize the acidic content of Mr. Ramesh soil. And so that would have been the correction right there. We are moving on. A soil scientist, and this could have been one of the list of the careers as we didn't mention, but these persons are the persons who deal with the management of the soil and they deal with the chemical and physical properties of the soil. So the soil scientist conducts an experiment to determine the effect of burning on soil erosion. Right? The data obtained from the study are presented in Table 1. But before we move to Table 1, we just want to talk a little bit about burning. And we know that burning is something that may have a positive uh, advantage or a disadvantage. So quickly, we use what we call slash and burn at times because this is a fast way to clear the land. Um, another positive is that when you burn, sometimes you get rid of those harmful insects and animals such as snake, um, scorpion, millipede, centipede, those things that may cause harm. Burning the ash also add a little potassium to the, to the soil. So those are some positive things. But the disadvantage, when you burn, you basically destroy the humus, the organic matter. That is what holds the soil together. That is what will be breaking down continuously to add nutrients. And so when you burn it, you're reducing that. So you're reducing the fertility of the soil. You're also damaging the structure of the soil, which allows it to be more, um, that allows erosion to occur more easily.
So once you remove the vegetation, you're causing the soil to be bare, right? So that is what we're talking about. So we're really going to get down into it. So treatment, we see that as the title for one of the columns, we see soil erosion per ton in terms of the hectare. So no burning, we still have soil erosion. Bear in mind, we cannot prevent soil erosion. We cannot prevent it, we can only control. Burning for 10 minutes, we have a situation where you increase that per ton 15, right? And then burning for 30 minutes. And just by looking at this table, we recognize a relationship. As we are increasing the method of burning, we are also increasing the soil erosion per ton or per hectare, right? What is soil erosion? Soil erosion is the removal of the topsoil, and this is due to the action of wind or water, right? Sometimes man will basically do things to accelerate erosion, like what we're doing here. We're burning, so that will actually accelerate, make it occur more often, make it occur more faster. So that's an issue. What is the relationship between burning and soil erosion? Tell the man to stop burn. Because guess what? And we didn't mention this about burning too as a disadvantage. Burning releases carbon dioxide. I'm sorry to backtrack a bit. But, you know, it's a part of the learning process. Burning releases carbon dioxide, which will basically increase the greenhouse gas. We know carbon dioxide is one of those gases we consider to be a greenhouse gas, which traps the heat and it will basically lead to global warming. A very um, controversial topic right now in terms of science, but we know the earth is actually getting warmer. So going back to this, the relationship as we burn or we increase burning, we basically increase soil erosion. Name, sorry, name one, it says, name one soil management practice that can be used to reduce soil erosion. And again, you notice when there was a prevent. So what is it? Let's go. Soil erosion can basically be targeted in such a way that we slow it down. How do we do that? Two things. Our focus is to cover the land, and that will reduce the impact of the wind or water. Or we basically reduce the flow of the runoff water. Runoff water is what is going to be carrying the soil particles away. So anything that we're going to be looking at is going to be aimed at doing one of two things. Cover the soil to prevent it from being bare or reduce the flow of runoff water. Let's get right into it. Now, cover cropping. That's one of our major things. And what we do in cover cropping is to plant a crop that will run on the surface of the soil. So sweet potato, cucumber, pumpkin, those crops that will provide that cover and the, reduce the impact of the raindrops. The raindrops will actually come with a force that can detach soil particles, causing it to move into a new location. And that's what we want to prevent. Because guess what? When you remove the topsoil, you're also removing the nutrients. Because majority of the nutrients are found in the first 1 to 15 or so inches of the soil. And so if you remove that, you're basically causing the soil to be less fertile. Which is going to be an issue in terms of your plants. Two, strip cropping. So when you go to a piece of land, you're going to be leaving strips untouched. You're not going to be removing those plants. Automatically, we want the space. And so current vegetation would be seen as weeds that would be in our space. But we're not going to be clearing the entire land, especially on a slope. So we will leave trees to be remaining on the plot of land while we remove another area. Right, so we leave strips of land uncultivated, and that will allow plants to remain to act as binders, to act as anchorage, to hold the soil in case we have a shower of rain. Cool. Other thing that we can do, we can do terracing. 
Now terracing deals with breaking up the slope into step-like structures. And the step-like structures, again, is aimed at slowing down the speed of runoff water. And so we allow the water to go down the slope in a more controlled manner. Once you can basically reduce that, then you can reduce the impact of the soil being taken away by the runoff water. We can actually do divergent ditches, we can do waterways, and their aim is to bring the water down a slope in a controlled manner, right? We can do contour farming, planting across the slope instead of up and down. And what this will do is to, again, basically reduce the speed of runoff water. We can practice mulching. So organic or inorganic, plastic or some um, grass, and what that does is to cover the soil. Again, we are reducing the impact of the raindrops. Zero grazing, rotational grazing, all of these will impact. We know animals will feed on the plot. And what they will do, especially like the low grazers, the sheep, they will eat right down to the ground. And so if you're not careful, they eat and allow all the soil to be bare. So what you can do is practice rotational grazing where you rotate them and allow for section to regrow and not have all the areas basically bare at any one time. Cool? We can add organic matter, which encourages growth, providing nutrients to, to, to plants, and so they will grow and add cover to the, to the, to the soil. Right? And we're going. Question 6. Your agricultural science class is responsible for rearing 100 boiler birds. Um, boiler chicks. We know boilers are the birds that we grow for meat. Right? And just to highlight, the layers are the ones that we grow for eggs. It says name the ration. When we think about a ration, we are thinking about what is it that we are... We're feeding to our organism. Again, studying, we have what we call a balanced ration, one that will basically give all the nutrients in their required proportion to the animal. We have, sorry, we have what we call a production ration, right? And a production ration, and we have a maintenance ration. Two weeks of age, what is the type of ration? We're going to be giving them starter. Now, the purpose of the starter, it contains a high percentage of crude protein. And crude protein is needed by the animal for growth and development. You want them to be growing. Because within six weeks, that is the time that we're going to be slaughtering these animals. Five to six weeks, dependent. Five weeks of age, we want to give them a finisher. And the finisher would be providing them with more fiber and more um, crude fat, and this will allow them to put on the weight, right? Moving along. Figure 2 shows brooding of one-day-old chicks in two different situations. So it's the situation A and with the situation B. Watch me now. Remember, in the wild, chickens, chickens basically sit on their eggs and they would, the hen would actually allow for the hatching of the eggs. You know, eggs are incubated for 21 days. And she'll basically turn it. We have artificial incubators. Why are we mentioning all of this? When the chickens are day old, they're not able to regulate their own body temperature. So you as the farmer, has, you have to do it for them. And we do that during the breed, brooding pro, um, process. During the brooding process, we have a brooder, and the brooder can be a gas brooder or a light brooder, and this will basically be providing the heat to the chickens, just as though they would cuddle with their mother hen. Now, when we look at situation A, we see the chickens more evenly distributed in the brooding area, and everybody is at the feeder, persons are at the chickens are at the water, and they're having, and they're moving around, and they're good. That situation shows that the brooder is at an optimum temperature. It's a correct temperature. They're good. All right? Watch me now. The, in situation B, the brooder can be a problem. What is the problem? The temperature is too high. And sometimes in life, 
and we, we want to use this as examples, we, we basically sometimes we recognize that persons are giving off too much negative energy. What do we do? We move from around them. So the chickens recognize that the temperature of the brooder is too high, so they are on the per even when time the person them have something where you want. And you know, we switch to the Jamaican um, language, even when. So while the persons may have something we need, we still don't go around them because we know that they are not good for us. So even though the feed is right under the, the, the brooder, which is what they need to have and to consume, you recognize that the chickens are not even going there. So they are on the perimeter of the brooder hiding because the temperature is too high. So one of the things as a farmer, you have to be um, observant. So, so just the reason for the difference in the way the chickens are, it is because of the brooder. The brooder has the correct temperature in A and the brooder is too hot in situation B. Not true. All right. State two advantages of artificial insemination. Once we hear artificial insemination, we're thinking about the male animal. Here's the thing. We have the sperm, we have the animal, we basically take that sperm from the animal, we store it, we mix it with certain um, chemicals to ensure that it is at a, of a nutritional level and maintenance while we basically use it to um, inseminate our females by placing it into the female reproductive tract of the farm animal. What is the advantage of this? Well, first off, if you have a male that is getting too old, so he's not able to now mount a female, or he may have a damaged leg, and so he's not capable of mounting the female, and you know that will create an, a, a problem. But guess what? This male has the characteristics that you want, your new or your, F1, your generation, the next generation of animals to have. You can't just do away with the animal like that. You can basically use artificial insemination where you collect the sperm from that animal and still use it in your breeding program, right? So the farmer will basically have a win-win. Chanua, and again with the Jamaican dialogue, we have some dangerous animal out there. So we have the bull sometimes, especially in cattle, that can basically be very dangerous. So it eliminates the farmer rearing a, a dangerous animal. And so what he will do is to just get the sperm from the animal and just in, um, inseminate his female when, is it, when he is ready. The next thing, we can basically, it is less expensive than to grow a male animal. So you can just collect the sperm from a, 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 a male Instead of growing him, you know that you'll need to think about housing, you need to think about food, you need to think about medication, what if that animal gets sick, and you, you, you basically, you know, have the time for that, right? So you can actually save money by just doing insemination. You have some venereal diseases, and so what is sometimes there's a ratio at times with animals in terms of male to female, so one male right, can basically have a 10 to 15 females. We're not talking about humans now, guys. We're talking about the animals. So that animal is a dream come true for that male animal, right? He is capable of mating with these animals, the females. But the thing about it, sometimes the female may have a, a sexually transmitted infection in terms of animals and what you find is that it can be transmitted around the herd if you're doing natural mating but with artificial insemination there's no contact between the bull or the male animal and the females and so it eliminates or reduces the spread of venereal diseases right so those are some of the advantages. Better efficiency use of sperm. Some of the sperm are not utilized when the animal mates, and so it's like you're wasting it. So when you do artificial insemination, we collect it, we test it, and we basically can improve on that. Good? B, 
Now, a farmer wants to produce goats during the months of October to December. His extension officer, and this is the person now who's guiding the farmer, giving him information, advise him to use extra synchronization. When we talk about extra synchronization, we're talking about heat. Heat. The period we're not talking about the sun at. Yeah, we know the sun. It's like, you know, the sun gets closer these days, not true? The heat period is a period when the female is willing to mate with the male and so what you will basically do is to give hormones that will allow the females in your herd to come on heat one time it's very advantageous because it really provide the the concept of have a uniform so when you look on some commercials and you see them showing like some some cattle right and you see everybody look similar same height and all of that it's because sometimes we do things like extra synchronization right or artificial insemination which we just spoke about his advice to the farmer is based on the information and once you you see agriculture is basically scientific facts acquired over a period of time meaning we do research we have to continually doing research and here's a simple in research in October, artificial insemination produced 70 um, goats, while extra synchronization gave us 100. And then, in November and December, both produced the same number of animals. It says, which is the better reproductive technique for producing goats over the, the, the months of October to December? Give one reason. Definitely, we are going with extra synchronization because what you find in the month of october while we got the same amount in november and december in the month of october we recognize that there were 30 more goats and probably somebody can work out that percentage for me what is the um the percentage difference in terms of the artificial insemination and the extra synchronization so we know that the extras would have been the one that we sorry we'll be going with and we're moving on and we're moving on wonderful so we're now at define each of the following terms working capital fixed capital now fixed capital is that asset that is not used up in your business so we don't really use it to make the 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 produce or the product that we're doing um this involves the land and the building and the machinery while working capital is the asset that is used up um, as raw material to create the product right subsidy is a financial um payback system right and so what we do is to actually use things such as a reduction or a payment in terms of inputs for your farm. So you may have a subsidy in terms of fertilizer. So it's kind of a cash or payback system. The government of a Caribbean country has given a rural community a tractor to assist them in agricultural production. So just three benefits of the tractor um, that the tractor will bring to the rural community benefit. We can start right at the benefit that you're thinking about. But let's think about this. Agriculture is normally seen as something, you know, demotivating in terms of not what you want to do. Right? It's not so fruitful. Uh, you say you want to become, do something in agriculture, persons may look at you a different way, right? In some of the Caribbean countries. But agriculture is really beneficial, right? We should think about getting. So the tractor, the younger persons in the community, for one, just bringing in that tractor will actually attract them because they're going to be seeing the use of this tractor as a means of you know, they normally just seeing the, the, the farmer out there in the sun and they can now see a technique where it is less um, work, um, less harder labor 
in terms of that and so it may actually attract younger persons to become more involved in that rural community in agriculture. In terms of speed and efficiency, definitely the tractor will bring that to the community. So the time it takes for somebody to do their manual land preparation, that time will cut dramatically, can be done in an hour by the tractor. Also, the tractor is going to bring the costs for producing down. And so the farmers there who are going to be engaged in agricultural activity can benefit by getting a higher profit because less money will be spent in terms of labor. You need to pay more for somebody to come and plow your land than to just use a tractor for an hour, right? So just three additional incentives the government can provide to further improve agriculture in this community. One of the incentives is to provide training and educational um, activities. And this will improve the quality of agricultural activities that will be done. The farming community will now have the expertise to carry out certain um, new and improved um, activities. The thing about it, we can basically also provide grants and loans you know, capital, the money needed to start a business is sometimes one which is very hard to come by. We don't have money sitting down around. And so when you look at a rural community, sometimes these are the areas that are experiencing a little bit of poverty. And so the government really would have to provide them with that um, loan or grant to get them off their feet. We have several of those programs in, in, in the Caribbean that, you know, they are there to try and improve. We also have other institutions, whether local, international, or regional institutions that are basically have an objective to, to provide that form of um, system to su support. Um, the next thing, we can actually have tax exemption. So we can allow the, the farmers to purchase things without being exposed to the high tax taxation that is there. And so it encourages them. Um, you can give them the inputs, such as seedlings and machines. Like, um, well, they just spoke about the tractor. So you can give them um, seedlings and other inputs, fertilizers, that will help them to carry out their task. Um, the... Complete the loan application. Watch me now. You're sitting down. You sit down and sometimes you, you, you're there and you, if you, the, 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 the person at the bank sometimes wondering what this person come in front of me. So you want a loan, master? Yeah, man, me want one loan. Me want to plant some, 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 cultivate some aki. But guess what? It's not just like that. Commercial banks are not just going to be providing you with a fund. They want to see something feasible. So one requirement is for you to come with a proposal. You need to have something to show what you're going to do with the money and also how you plan to manage your business. Remember the factors of production, land, labor, capital management. The management part is very critical. All of them combine to make your business successful. So the management, if you're not showing how the money is going to be spent, then we have a problem. We definitely going to have a problem. Two, if it is that you don't, if you're not aligned yourself with the institution in your country. So like Jamaica, we talk about the Rural Agricultural Development Authority, rather, which is the arm that deals with farmer registration. So if you're not registered with RADA, you may go to the, 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 how will they know that you are indeed a farmer? So you should be registered, right? The other thing in terms of the requirements, you may be required to have collateral or a guarantor, and these are things that you can use as security for the loan. In case something happens and you need to repay the loan, the, the, the loan. they look at credit worthiness, are you a person who, you know, 
you kind of give that we 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 have to know that side eye so when you when you come to the the, the 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 loan officer and the loan officer looks over and see that you have couple loans outstanding and then start look on you with a side eye and you say okay then problem there no so credit worthiness is very important you want to ensure that you if you had borrowed loan before you would have been paying them back and you've been being holding up to your part um part of your obligations right so that's that all right briefly describe each of the following methods of controlling pests and disease in agriculture manual manual basically involves just removing the insect or the pest so well the the pests would have been visible on the plant or animal and we just remove them mechanical the use of a tool or a machine to rid the pest or disease from our plot and then of course chemical which includes the use of pesticide and we know pesticide is a broad name we have rod rodenticide which is used to kill rodents we have weedicide or herbicide which is used to kill weeds we have fungicide fungal infection we have um nematicide used to kill nematodes insecticide used to kill insects and we have a few more and so basically these are the things these are the the headings or what you would have basically have been done to control pest and disease in agriculture under the different headings moving along now cardi caribbean agriculture research and development institute has been informing farmers and you know one of the objective of cardi is to carry a research in the region and so they are doing a research currently based on this question about white fly infestation on tomato production now they conclude concluded an experiment on the use of sticky traps and insecticides on white fly control table 3 shows the results of the experiment so watch me now the control of white fly you know some white fly here very damaging to your plants so number of dead white flies we notice using sticky trap is 1000 the number of dead white flies using an insecticide is 4000 the number of dead white fly using sticky trap and the insecticide is 5100 what three conclusions can can be drawn from the information in table 3 one of the things that we see right out in front of us is that sticky trap is the method that is you know it's the the most the least effective method is sticky trap right the the method are combining both methods using the sticky trap a combination of the sticky trap and the insecticide is the best way to control the white flies then of course the third is that the insecticide is a better method or a more effective method than the sticky trap So just three other methods that can be used to control white flies in tomato production. Now we want to talk about biological control. We have a situation where we can have some um parasitic wasp that will basically just go and kill the white flies. So that's a means of biological. We have organic where unlike the insecticide these will not provide some form of harm so you can use what you know your your regular um situation bear in mind you have to ensure you 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 think about the 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 the, the contents and how it will affect the plant um so neem oil um some of these mixtures can be sprayed on plants some persons use soap water some persons use a little bit of alcohol and so they can use that to control the white fly we know that some in some cases there's been a little research about the mulch and the reflection that it provides and also it will reflect on you know kind of warn off some of the white flies i'm not sure how effective that is 
but cultural methods such as the type of mulch that we use can be used. A livestock officer decides to introduce a new forage legume um, in, from Africa into a Caribbean country. The legume seeds arrive at the airport right but had to be destroyed by the plant quarantine officer and these are persons who ensure that the diversity the biodiversity in one's country is not a threat and so anything that will pose a threat they will have to step in and we're thinking that that's what happened right here so just three re possible reasons why the seeds had to be destroyed by the plant quarantine officer one of the reasons probably the seeds that were um, on the plane, weren't they from the legume? Maybe a different um, um, type of seed was sent incorrectly, and so they were destroyed. Two, the seeds that were sent, they recognized that they had tested for positive for a particular disease, and so they didn't want to, to just introduce this legume and have it introduce the disease to our plants and cause death to our local um, crop. Three, the legume seeds may be one that will actually, when you do the research, cause harm to the animals that we have here. So it could have been something that is poisonous. And so we had to allow the quarantine officer to get rid of those seeds. Name three ingredients that can be used in making livestock feed. And we spoke about feed earlier. We want something that is going to be nutritious and actually palatability is something that is of a concern. The older animal, um, it tastes. And you know, in Jamaica, we, we have been seeing that little meme going around with brownie. And one of them, then would have said like, you know, the, the food not good, throw it or get brownie. So oftentimes we think that we can give animals the food that we don't want. We see that happening with pets at home. So you throw the bone, get a dog. And not thinking that the animal is one that really thinks about um, the quality of food. You have persons who have dogs currently and if you throw certain things at them, they may look at you and again give you that, that side eye and say, how we might, how we might get that to If the dog could have talked. He would have said that. We am I doing that? So three ingredients. Molasses is one. We put that in our, in our feed. And again, that increases the palatability. It increases the taste of the feed. Corn, corn, very um, important ingredient in terms of carbohydrates. So it gives the, the animal that carbohydrates, source of carbohydrates. We have bagas that we use, we use citrus pulp um, that would have been minerals and vitamins. We basically also provide them with a little rice bran um, that would basically provide them with wheat, we provide them with coconut meal, we provide them with, with fish meal. And fish meal, you know, fish has a high protein content. A poultry farmer wants to know if rearing boilers on sand is better than rearing them on wood shavings litter. And we know litter, two times we meet up on litter in agriculture. Litter when we talk about the group of animals born at the same time from a female. So we say I talk about the litter for a pig. And we also talk about litter when we're dealing with poultry. And that is the substance that we use as the bedding for the chickens. So here's the situation. We are using the concept of sand versus the the wood shavings and the effect of sand on wood sh and wood shavings later on the feed conversion ratio right over four week is shown in table four so if you notice at week one we have week two we have week three and then we have week four a little thing about feed conversion ratio this is the amount of feed um, that the animal would basically take in and convert to meat or egg or milk but in this case we are talking about the boiler so we are talking about meat the thing about it the lower the feed conversion ratio the better it is because we know feed is one of those inputs that is carrying up your expense as a as a farmer so it's the main expense of input 
right, to a livestock farm. So what you want to look at for the fourth week of SCR on San, you have a 3.0 to 1. So what this really means that 3.0 kg of feed would basically provide them with 1 kilogram of weight. And that's while you're growing the animals, the birds on sand. While growing them on wood shavings, 2.5 kilograms of feed will allow them to gain one kilogram of weight. And this is what we're talking about. We have less feed on the wood shavings providing that same weight. Again, my apologies about the... So you're supposed to calculate the average FCR over the four-week period um, for sand and the wood shavings. All you need to do, and you can comment the answer, you're going to be adding the week, and then you divide by four to get the average. All right? So you do that for the FCR. Based on that, we know on what we were talking is that the... The better system of rearing the boilers would have been that of the wood shavings. And so, so just one reason is because you're taking less feed. So that's less expense to basically provide the same weight. Right? Explain one possible effect. One possible effect of each of the, of the two systems on the health of the boilers. Now we know that the, the sun basically has some positive attributes. It reduces the buildup of um, flies, infestation. It also allows you to basically, you know, in terms of the, the, the no, no respiratory um, illness will occur when, so often when you use sun. And, of course, the disadvantage is to the feet of the birds. When the birds are placed on the sand, it can basically damage their feet. As a matter of fact, you may actually utilize less. So in Jamaica, we, we, we cook something what we call chicken foot soup. Right? And so the chicken foot soup is very nutritious. And so if you are going to be growing them on the sand, sometimes they get or develop um, corn, and so it's not attractive for the consumer to see these on the feet of the bird and want to purchase it. So that's one possible effect in terms of the, 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 the visibility of the corn and also damaging to the bird. Two, when you think about the health, as we said, the wood shavings, it will absorb the droppings, yes, but you can have a higher risk of the, the, the respiratory illness. And that is a problem in, 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 to the animals. The pneumonia, bronchitis, those diseases is going to be more evident, right? Suggest so three other management practices that can affect the performance of boiler birds up to market age. First, we're going to be looking at brooding. And brooding is that care that you have to do for the first one to three days, depending on your location. And so the birds are not able to manage their or regulate their body temperature. So you have to do it for them. And so if you're, if you're not maintaining the proper heat, then they can actually be in an area where they're too hot and they undergo stress, being too cool, and they cuddle against each other, step on other birds, and that causes deformity between your birds or cause the death of your birds. Um, just think about 25,000 birds in a, in a poultry house and the temperature is not right and everybody trying to gather together. Somebody will be stepped on, right? And so we have to look at the brooding. Also feed. We know that different stages of the life, the lifespan of the bird may require different energy or nutrient requirement. We spoke about it earlier. For the first part, we use starter. For the second part, we use finisher. So you have to use 
a, a, a structured way, you know, you go about providing the feed requirement. Also, you have to look at what you're feeding them. Does it have all the requirements needed? Sometimes you have to add supplements, hypervit, right? Um, some persons go natural and put, place aloe vera in the water, place molasses in the water. And what this will do is to improve the, the immune system of the bird. Let them be less... Um, susceptible to diseases and so that will ensure that they are basically better off we can look at water water providing water again is very critical because you want to ensure that water is there continuously the bird should never be out of water also we can look at heat management practices installing a cooling system a fan turning the litter improving the ventilation and the, the host design. All of this is very important because you want to manage heat. Heat can lead to stress. Stress, stress can lead to them undergoing, um, losing weight. It can lose to death. It can lose to, it, it can reduce your FCR. It can cause the birds to practice cannibalism. So all of this is very important. Now it came, it comes to the end of this session. It was a 20, 2012. Thanks for, you know, staying with me. Went in detail. You can comment below in terms of your questions. Um, leave a like. You can subscribe. And I hope you do well in your external CSEC exam. Thank you for making it buckle down. All right. We are buckled down.